let's talk about the process and the experience of becoming soldiers. The difficulties encountered by the recruits, by the new officers, and by the societies and the communities that send them to war in 1861. In order to do that, we're going to spend a little bit of time here up front talking about things that are happening beyond the battlefield of Shiloh. And it's going to be important, I think, to do that so that we can understand the people that fought this battle and understand some of their experiences. Certainly, they were not soldiers the way we would think of soldiers now in our professional army. Uh, these were volunteer soldiers, and certainly they were, they were young men uh, who were very recently civilians uh, and who had never been soldiers previous to that. They also were young men that came to the war with certain preconceptions about what it was to be a soldier. They came from communities that had preconceptions of what it meant to organize soldiers. And they came from a, uh, a cultural or social political organization that was just finding its way to making war. So even if we're talking about 1861, can't really compare what's happening in the United States, north or south, with what you might see in Europe, uh, where there are uh, trained reserves ready to be called up. Uh, no, these people came to the war with nothing but a preconception of what they thought it would be, a preconception based upon the very limited experiences of the United States with warfare, or at least warfare as they would come to understand it in the Civil War. That's a little ironic to say that because the history of the United States from the Revolution through westward expansion is a series of one war after another. Even when we take our history classes, the, the landmarks in history are wars. Um, and uh, when we go back to talk about the Industrial Revolution or something like that, we kind of paint that over the, 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 the canvas that we've already put up. The canvas has wars painted on it. The Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, uh, various wars against the native peoples as... as uh, you know, U.S. Uh, as the Anglos push west. Um, the U.S.-Mexico War in 1846, the wars against each other in bleeding Kansas and elsewhere coming up to the Civil War. But none of those wars would have made any sense to what finally happened in 1861. They thought they knew it was coming, and as we will see here at Shiloh, they had no idea what was coming. So what did they think was coming? All of the previous, uh, all of the previous wars had required volunteers. Volunteers to flock to the flag, do some uh, training, and then march off to war, usually for a short period of time maybe a year, maybe two years or three years. Uh, and, um, and, it was and the military organizations were based on the idea that volunteers would come from the community, go to war, and then come back home. Uh, 
Americans in, prior to the Civil War were very suspicious of professional military organizations. Uh, and the standing army was very, very small. What, there's 17, 16, 17,000 regulars on duty in 1860. And by the time the Civil War was won, two million men had served in the Union Army, 700,000 or more in the Confederate Army. That's the difference between scale of, that we're talking about. The idea that they thought they would come up with in 1861 would be, again, that volunteers would flock to the flag and that there would be uh, a, a fairly short war. Although uh, recently a, a fine scholar named Jason Phillips has come out with a really great new book just published that analyzes what Americans thought the war would be. And some Americans were pretty sure that it would be long and bloody, but others thought that it would be short and, and not so bloody. So we're gonna look at one particular neighborhood and that is good in that one particular region and, and talk about how they formed uh, their military organizations and who these people were. The one thing that they had to get over and the one thing that they would get over is what I call the Minuteman myth. The Minuteman myth. In 1860, everybody in the U.S., North or South, worshipped the idea of the Minuteman. Those patriots of 1776 who were strong, independent, land-holding farmers that that uh, when, the, when the red coats came down the road, they went to their hearth and they grabbed their musket from above the hearth and they all gathered together and they went out and they fought at Lexington Green. Or they ambushed the red coats at, at, at Concord and chased them back to, uh, uh, to Boston. That experience from the revolution uh, created a real, uh, a, a real stereotype in the minds of Americans, in their own personal identity. We are strong, independent people that you don't mess with us individually. Now, all of that leads to the idea that when an emergency will come up, everybody will rush to the flag and quickly organize a militia and the militia will go out and, and they'll beat up whoever's threatening the community, the neighborhood, the country, and then come back. The idea of training an army such as one would need to win a huge Napoleonic style war, like what we're going to see from 1861 to 1865, was foreign to them. And it required professional ability. It required training. It required education. And these were all things that were anathema to the people that believed that Americans as, as strong, independent Americans, we would just grab our musket from above the hearth and go out and fight the enemy. Okay, that's as much big picture as I want to put into it right now. Now I want to talk about this regiment. Um, the 70th Ohio began its experience late in the summer of 1861. Uh, they began recruiting in the area around West Union, Ohio, and that is the area down toward the Ohio River, the southernmost section of Ohio, uh, east and south of Cincinnati. It's, a, it's a, an area of rolling farms, an area immediately adjacent to the Ohio River, and as such, the men that came from that neighborhood had an identity that was very much attached to the Ohio River. Uh, so we're, we could call them Ohioans or Buckeyes or any of that, and they'd all be very proud of that identity, but they would also be part of a community that we might call the Trans-Ohio community. The community that lives on the Ohio River and everything, uh, accor everything according to their economy, everything in their economy, everything and their identity is drawn to the Ohio River, and then it leaps the Ohio River. And their neighbors on the other side of the Ohio in Kentucky also have this sort of trans-Ohio identification. So those people over there are Kentuckians, but more importantly and more practically, 
they're river people and they are and, and they they're dependent on the river and the steamboats come and go the flatboats come and go they trade on the river and they have a sort of cosmopolitan outlook that maybe the people further northern further north in Ohio or further south in Kentucky wouldn't have in their identity they're attached to the river so we'll call those trans Ohio uh, kind of people but they they come together and begin to organize at West Union Ohio uh, a politician from the neighborhood a former one-term congressman um, and a state representative named Joseph R. Cockrell was chosen by uh, the governor of Ohio to be the colonel of the regiment. Uh, colonel Cockrell came from what you would call the political general arm of, uh, uh, of uh, leadership. We usually look at these political generals in Civil War history and we like to kick them around a lot. You know, the political generals are all a bunch of buffoons and and uh, the professionals from West Point, they know how to get things done. Uh, at the same time, at the time, the volunteers, meaning the political generals, political colonels, would look at the West Pointers and go, those guys don't know what they're doing. They're all theoretical and they're all, they, they're all puffed up and pompous and so on. And so from the beginning of the war, you have this tug between the political and the professional, uh, from the popular and the professional. <laughs> from the professionally trained military and the volunteers. And uh, sometimes the stereotype of the volunteer officer played out and they turned out to be totally out of their depth. Other times, those people really grabbed the reins, hit the books, and learned their new profession very quickly. And we're going to have two examples of that within eyesight of each other right here and right now. We're near the camp of the 70th Ohio, which was commanded by Colonel Cockrell, and I think we're going to see within a few minutes that Colonel Cockrell was one of those people that really grabbed the reins and learned how to command men. Uh, if we look behind us and through the woods, uh, you can't really see it right now because the woods are starting to bloom out, you would see the Ray Field uh, about 500 yards in that direction, and there, another Ohio regiment from Southern Ohio, also men that we could identify as trans-Ohioan people, the 53rd Regiment of Ohio Volunteers, organized in Jackson, Ohio, uh, with Colonel Jesse Appler from Portsmouth. And Jesse Appler, we will find out, uh, was uh, a much more fit the stereotype of the volunteer officer, the political officer who failed when faced with, uh, uh, with combat. Uh, so there's at least two kinds of officers to look at, and we'll try to compare those uh, once or twice during the course of our program. Now, before we get to the next, the next topic, I want everybody to, uh, I probably should have asked this a minute ago, who has seen the movie? Who's watched the movie Shiloh Fiery Trial, which is our, uh, uh, our orientation film? Okay. One of the best parts of that movie, I think, is the story of young John Cockrell, who's the son of the Union Colonel, and he's only 16 years old, and he came with his father, and uh, I think he borrowed a musket and watched the first part of the battle from Shiloh Chapel, and then later was separated from his father. Somebody told him your father got killed. Finally, at the end of the battle, what? Well, at the end of the movie, what happened? Reunited. They reunited, and this wonderful quote from John Cockrell, see, my father came and gave me the most affectionate embrace he had ever given me. It's, it's a great story, and if you haven't seen this orientation film, go see it. We're not going to talk that much about John Cockrell now, because you can learn about him there. The point of this program, uh, from, from that point of view, is to give you the rest of the story on what you're seeing in the orientation film. Uh, and that is the story uh, that you learn in the orientation film, the personal story of Colonel Cockrell and his son. And now we're going to learn the rest of the story of the regiment uh, and what happened to the regiment during the battle. So finally, before we start, I want to take just a couple of steps in order to get us to the battlefield. 70th Ohio, organized at West Union, Ohio, 
from these men, from these river community men, or just back from the river, and organized through the late summer and fall of 1861. And one thing that Colonel Cockrell began to instill in his regiment from the time they were training on those fairgrounds north of West Union, Ohio, was the importance of following army regulations in the organization, training, and livelihood of the regiment. Now, one of the, one of the training manuals um, that, uh, that Cockrell might have had access to, I know he would have had access to, whether he had it, used it or not, is a, a, a training manual by a, a, a guy who was later a Union general named Daniel Butterfield. And uh, Butterfield wrote, uh, you, know, you might have Hardy's tactics or Casey's tactics, and ba Butterfield wrote a fine little primer for officers about how to camp, how to camp, how to march, mm -hmm. how to organize, and how to live healthy and keep your troops healthy. And Butterfield, I think, in his, I'm going to have to paraphrase, but I'm pretty close to quoting, uh, says something to the effect of a colonel needs to understand the domestic economy of his regiment. And he cannot know too much about this. He uses that phrase, the domestic economy, uh, meaning essentially Butterfield sees the a regiment as a household and people need to maintain their household. Now, this brings us to a very important thing that we know, most, mostly know about armies in camp and about the Civil War. More men died from disease than from battle. Do we know that? We're familiar with that, with that fact. More men. And, and, but, and then the, the idea of why they did that, having to do with germ theory and so on, and cleanliness and so on and so forth, that stuff came about 1870 or so, medically speaking. But in 1861, the army, the professional end of the army, absolutely knew that keeping the camp clean kept the men alive and off the sick list. They knew not to build a camp downstream from a latrine. You're not supposed to know that. They know that the camp is supposed to be cleaned every day. They know that the animals should be kept a certain distance from the men. They know that the sinks, meaning the latrines, should be dug a certain distance from the camp. And that every single day, every single officer needs to keep every single man clean. Cleaning up the camp, policing the camp, cleaning themselves. And if they stay clean, more men will stay on duty and fewer men will die. Uh, a good example of that is these new regiments, these two, these green regiments, arrived here at Shiloh, authorized strength of a thousand men, meaning a thousand men had originally signed up for each of these regiments. And immediately they start training in places like West Union, and immediately these young men start getting sick, you know, because now there's crowds of young men living together closely. Um, so we'll compare the 70th Ohio to the 53rd Ohio, two regiments from the same region with the same type of man commanding them. Uh, you know, a political officer, if you might want to call it that. The 70th Ohio, under Colonel Joseph Cockrell, came from West Union, and Cockrell got more, got almost 900 of his original recruits to this camp out of a thousand. On the day of battle, when the Confederates came up this hill, Joe Cockrell was able to put 800 of his men in the line of battle. Meaning all this leading up to the fight that we're gonna talk about, all this domestic economy, all this camping, cleaning up the filth, keeping the men healthy, Cockrell was able to keep, was able to bring 800 of a thousand original recruits to the first battle. By comparison, Colonel Appler of the 53rd Ohio, also starting with about a thousand men at about the same time, was able to bring about 650 of his original recruits to Shiloh, the rest having fallen off 
being on the sick list, uh, getting sick and dying for one reason or another while they're still in Ohio. They haven't even gotten on the boats. On the day of battle, Appler's sick list was about 150 men. And his, his regimental hospital, which is over here in Rayfield near where the Mississippi Monument is now, had 156 sick men in it. And the 53rd Ohio brought about 500 men to the battlefield. Appler owed the government a thousand soldiers to fight in a battle. By the time they fought their first battle, 500 of them were gone. By comparison, a very similar cohort, similar type of officer, similar type of regiment with men from the same region, 800 of them come here. So that's a good example strictly of leadership of the domestic economy of the regiment. Keep the men healthy. Keep the men thinking about health. Every time the 70th Ohio camped, they set up their tents, they cleaned it out. If they could, if they, if they had time to build bunks up off of the ground, they did that. At the same time, the 53rd Ohio guys were not being held to their tasks. They're sleeping in the mud, they're getting dirty, they're getting sick. That brings us to April 6, 1862. And so, before we start talking about the fighting, let's move on to our next stop, which is just down the trail here at the monument to the 70th Ohio Infantry. Ready? Let's go. Monument to the 2nd Tennessee Regiment, commanded by Colonel William Bate, later Major General William Bate, and in 1895, Tennessee Senator William Bate. Uh -huh. So, 2nd Tennessee Monument is going to say what Senator Bate wants it to say, <laughs> and it's going to sit where Senator Bate wants it to sit. That's another, that's another story. The, the story of how the monuments you know, came to be where they are is another very fascinating story. Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Does any of you be a master? <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the. Uh, but okay. Let's get back to the 70th Ohio here. Uh, clock's ticking. Got to learn. 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 <laughs> okay. So the 70th Ohio. We got them. We got them recruited in West Union. We got them trained. They got to Ripley, Ohio. They got on steamboats. They came down to Paducah, Kentucky. Then they were organized into part of a division. And it was a division made up of 12 infantry regiments and then some artillery and even some cavalry attached to it, all under the command of Brigadier General, later soon to be Major General, William T. Sherman. Uh, so they will become part of Sherman's brigade. Now, like I said, 12 Regiments of infantry are the core of Sherman's division. Sorry, I said brigade, I meant division. These 12 regiments are subdivided into four brigades, meaning each of the four brigades has three infantry regiments in it. Uh, so these 12 regiments are going to be bundled together into 1st Brigade, 2nd Brigade, 3rd Brigade, 4th Brigade, all Sherman's division. The Brigade to which the 70th Ohio was attached was commanded by a man named uh, Colonel Ralph Buckland. Colonel Buckland's brigade. And it is the 70th Ohio, the 48th Ohio Regiment from Cincinnati, and the 72nd Ohio Regiment from Northern Ohio. Uh, and so all three of these regiments are going to work together in, as a brigade. Colonel Cockerell, Joe Cockerell, will be. Colonel commanding the 70th Ohio, one of the regiments of the brigade. When they arrived on this hill, when they arrived on this hill on or about the 16th of March, 16th and 17th of March, 1862, General Sherman needed to deploy 
his division into a camp. Also with a mind, because he's a professional soldier, with a mind to the domestic economy of his division. Where should, the, where should these regiments camp and why should they camp here? He issued an order saying that all of the regiments should camp along this ridge, oriented in that direction, down the roadway, it's about southwest, basically is where we're looking right now, overlooking this, this creek right here. Uh, so that, and this is, in the or, this is in the order, so that in the event they're attacked, the soldiers can form on their parade grounds, march forward, and immediately be in a position to defend their camps. Now, Colonel Buckland absolutely complied with that order to the letter. And you look behind you, you'll see the monument of the 70th Ohio, and the camp of the 70th Ohio is on the hill behind it. If you went down that trail there, you'd find the monument of the 48th, 48th Ohio camp at the top of the hill. Further down there, 72nd Ohio Regiment, monument where they fought, their camp on top of the hill. So Buckland followed the orders to the letter. His uh, colleague, Colonel Jesse Hildebrand, commanding the 3rd Brigade, did not follow the orders. And not necessarily to the credit of General Sherman, General Sherman did not seem to want to hold Hildebrand to his orders. So Hildebrand had two regiments camped on this side of the creek, and a third one, the 53rd Ohio, who we've been talking about, Colonel Appler, on the other side of the creek and 600 yards in front of the creek. This demonstrates that General Sherman, although he uh, was determined to have a good camp and a healthful camp, also did not anticipate that he would be attacked in this camp. Uh, in that he gave an order that the camp should be set up in such a way as to make it easily defensible, but he did not enforce the order for all of his troops. Uh, nevertheless, Buckland's, Buckland followed the order and Cockrell had his eight, on the morning of April 6, 1862, Cockrell had his 800 men in camp on top of the hill. At seven in the morning, now we know at, at early before dawn, we know that those skirmishing started out there in the Fraley Field, about a mile from where we are right now. By seven in the morning, those Confederates had moved far enough across the landscape and the the battle was brewing up enough that General Sherman knew that he was probably going to have to fight for his camp. And he called out everybody, called out all the infantry and all the cavalry, and they needed to comply with that original order. Form on their parade ground and move forward. Now that didn't happen very well in the 3rd Division, in the, in the 3rd Brigade under Hildebrand, and it happened, and it happened a little differently in the 1st Brigade under Colonel McDowell over here to the west, but the 4th Brigade, Colonel Buckland's Brigade, everything worked according to plan. The three regiments formed every one of their men on their color lines. They stepped off, they advanced 200 yards, and just about the time that Confederate General Patrick Claiborne's brigade came down the other side of that hill and into this creek bottom, the 70th Ohio got to this position. Took position in line of battle, each man elbow to elbow with the man next to him, 800 men, which is very impressive, <laughs> in line of battle from basically from the road um, all the way up next to the church, up over this nose of the ridge down into that ravine and linking up with the 48th Ohio under Colonel Peter Sullivan, who's doing the same thing down there. A perfect line of battle according to the plan. And then at this point, this phase of the battle, everything went according to General Sherman's plan. General Claiborne brought his Confederates down that hill. They got into those creek. That creek was very overgrown with underbrush, vines, thorns, things like that, down into those creek. It broke up the Confederate advance. The Confederates had to, had to struggle through the creek bottom and out of the creek 
And as soon as they emerged from the bushes, <clears throat> this entire brigade was in a position to just side through that line volleys of musket balls. They could just send clouds of lead right down into that swamp and anybody caught on thorns, vines, tripping on <laughs> tripping on bushes or trying to cut their way through. At least one of the one of the Confederate commanders said you, a man a, an individual man could not get through that morass without cutting his way with a knife. So don't for a minute imagine that the second Tennessee regiment was coming down through that creek in a line of battle, ready to give as good as they got when they got to the open ground. Uh, they came out of that morass, they stumbled out onto this open area, and they were cut down by Union volleys. At the same time, they did their best to return fire, uh, but in the case of these regiments, casualties were initially very low. Now. Uh, Private William Connolly did remember, he was part of Company G, he would have been right over here. Confederate cannons by this time were in place on the high ground on the other side. And they could be dueling with Captain Barrett's batteries over here, or, uh, uh, or another Union battery um, back up over in this direction. But also firing into the Union infantry. Uh, and I believe it was Private... Uh, Private W.J. Ellis was standing at his post of duty over here when a Confederate cannonball came hurtling across this ravine and struck Private Ellis on the head and killed him. And killed him in a manner that obviously would have been spectacularly traumatic uh, for him and for all of his comrades who were there to see it. Uh, and they all remembered it for the rest of the war. They all knew that Bill Ellis was the first guy killed, and they remember the circumstances under which he died, and Connolly wrote about it 20 or 30 years later. Uh, he remembered it so vividly. But really, that was about it. The Confederate infantry was stuck, and by stuck, it all, that means they were almost totally unable to resist the Union resistance that was coming down at them. So this is not an episode of the Battle of Shiloh where both sides are slaughtering each other face to face. This is a very tragic episode of the Confederates trying to come through a well-planned ambush, pretty much as you could call it that. Uh, Sherman determined, whether he was serious about it or not, that he would keep this swamp in front of his camp. Mm -hmm. And if the Confederates tried to come through it, they would cut him down. And it worked exactly as he planned because very few of these Federals got hurt over the next two hours. Now, after Claiborne's brigade was driven back, another Confederate brigade came up, Patton Anderson's brigade, and they went down into the morass, and, and the survivors of Claiborne's brigade intermingled with Anderson's brigade, and they came rushing out of there and came rushing up this hill and tried to engage the 70th Ohio, 48th Ohio, Barrett's Battery, 72nd Ohio, and again, they were driven back. Again, they were cut down on this uh, on this low ground and driven back in after that bushrod johnson's brigade came right up the road into the swamp gathered up the survivors of the other two brigades and they came up the hill and by 10 o'clock a third confederate brigade was getting chewed up trying to come up this hill the battle of shiloh was just opening and three confederate brigades had already been shivered by trying to attack a Union line of battle, not behind entrenchments, just standing on top of this hill, a Union line of battle from the front. Now, fortunately for the Confederates and unfortunately for the Federals, other Confederates were moving to the east and moving through the Ray Field. And they encountered Colonel Appler in his 53rd Ohio. And Colonel Appler in his 53rd Ohio did some fighting in their camp but the most, what we remember the 53rd Ohio most for these days, compare the same men from the same region, the same type of man commanding, Joe Cockrell keeping his men here fighting, Jesse Appler, the first important order he gave to his regiment was retreat and save yourselves. And then he led the 53rd Ohio on a stampede from their camp 
back across the creek and to the rear, leaving a hole on the left end of General Sherman's line. And so all this morning, while things are looking great in front of the 70th Ohio, and while these poor Confederates are suffering and dying down in the, down in the front, other Confederates are coming around <clears throat> the left flank, turning that left flank of the Union line and starting to come in in that direction. So the 53rd Ohio abandoned their position. Shortly after that, the Confederates got around the edge of a battery of artillery, a Waterhouse's battery. And then the 57th Ohio, they were flanked and they were driven back. Finally, only the 77th Ohio from Colonel Hildebrand's brigade is left on top of that hill right there, standing directly in front of the Shiloh Church building. And the Confederates get around the edge of that, around the left end of that, and 77th starts to give back. And that finally, at 10 o'clock in the morning, somewhere between 10 and 10, 15 in the morning, General Sherman realized he could not hold this position any longer, and he ordered Buckland's 4th Brigade to retreat from this position. Now, the first retreat took them back to the camp line of the 70th Ohio. That's where we're going to go right now. Ready? of the camp of the 70th Ohio. In every camp, for every regiment of infantry, every battery of artillery, and every battalion or regiment of, of uh, cavalry in the Union Army is marked across this battlefield. So you can always tell uh, where somebody was camped. 70th Ohio was camped here. But what does the camp mean? It means that this little marker marks the front and the center of a small city, a small town of 800 to 1,000 men. We've been living in a community stretched out over here for about three weeks. So if it's 1,000 men, that means there are 10 companies of 100 men each. Each of those companies has a certain number of tents for the men to live in. In, the case, in this case, the style is the Army Sibley tent. Uh, it's a circular tent with a pole that goes up through the middle, uh, looks kind of like a pyramid, and uh, it can fit 12, 20 uh, enlisted men in it. Each of the 10 companies organizes their Sibley tent in a straight line from the front to the back. Every morning, the men get out of their tents, they get cleaned up, they put on their, their uniforms for inspection, they walk down a lane to the front of their camps, and then they get in a line for inspection from over there to down there. So, 10 rows of Sibley tents. In between those 10 rows of Sibley tents, 10 <laughs> camp streets. A color line out in front. Um, and then behind the Sibley tents, the officers' tents. Behind the officers' tents, the hay park and the corral where the animals live, because infantry regiments have a lot of horses and mules in them. Uh, not just cavalry regiments have these four, four-legged troops. Infantry regiments have them too. And then behind that, the officers' latrine. The, men's, the enlisted men's latrine is in the front of the camp, thus satisfying the military imperative of keeping enlisted men and officers as far away as possible uh, when they're doing their thing. <laughs> um, but what we're looking at right now, when you imagine the, the 70th Ohio falling back to their camp line, is they fall back here, and then behind them is all these Sibley tents. Behind, in front of the Sibley tents 
are uh, are fires, and campfires, and and maybe some of the camp cooks still have uh, breakfast cooking. They thought that we'd win the battle, and the guys would come back and they'd eat breakfast. Um, the uh, uh, the civilian employees of the army, uh, teamsters, and so on, that might be attached to a regiment, are here, and so they're fleeing to the rear now. That it's clear that the Confederates are coming up the hill, and the Confederates are coming from this direction. So. The second stage of the 70th Ohio's defense is to fight in this area as the Confederates come. Finally, after two hours of slaughter, the Confederates come up over the top of that hill, and now they have a chance to get their licks in and fire upon the 70th Ohio. Now, again, face to face, this line of battle does everything a Napoleonic line of battle is designed to do shoot clouds of lead to the front to keep to either cut down the enemy or or, or, or keep them hiding or keep them you know uh, ruin their aim or whatever they're going to do but what's going wrong ever and forever in Sherman's line is that left that left keeps collapsing again and again now those can the seventh of the Ohio begins to move to the rear and those cannons of Barrett's battery have to be quickly limbered up and taken to the rear, galloping to the rear, and now Confederates are back here, and Federal and, and, and Union soldiers from these regiments, from these Ohio regiments, are fleeing the Confederates that are flanking them on their left, so that means they're running behind the 70th Ohio, and running through their camps, and running behind the camps, and as the 70th Ohio guys load and fire here, they can see what's happening behind them. Um, uh, during this part of the battle, one of the officers from one of the regiments over here uh, told a story of uh, they were falling back through the cemetery and they were still fighting and uh, one of the soldiers got shot in the shin, a uh, very painful wound, and he shouted out and his, his captain said, uh, go to the rear, go to the rear, and the guy disappears to the rear, comes back about five, limping back about five minutes later, says, Cap, give me a gun, this blame fight ain't got any rear. <laughs> hmm. So by this time, yeah, there is no rear for the 70th Ohio anymore. They're fighting someone there, and the Confederates are starting to flow through behind them on the heels of a wave of fleeing panicked refugees from the left. And now it's their turn. Now the Confederates are coming from the left. And again, Colonel Cockrell has to order his men to fall back. This time they cannot fall back in line of battle. Why? Why cannot they keep this line of battle the tents. because they're tense now it's pretty much everybody for himself as they fall back through the tents as the confederates mm -hmm. pursue them uh, and by this time uh, who got to hear that rebel yell this morning from uh, ranger yeah. arnold and yeah that's what they're doing except not two dozen people yeah. <laughs> several thousand confederates are starting to feel like they're about to win this battle and they and they got their blood up and they got their hate up their anger from being shot down in that swamp all morning long and things start to collapse very quickly for the 70th ohio let's fall back a little bit more let's go back up where it's easier walking on the uh on the old trail up there or rather that's an old, an old truck to power line Off the ground. 
uh, and they got themselves off the ground. Other people in other regiments, they're, because their officers did not hold them to their duty, were sleeping on the ground, sleeping in the mud, and complaining, and then getting sick, and then they're lo- yeah. uh, So, I mean, various different regiments in Sherman's Army had different, very different experiences. And they're, as I've said many times, in this program already, they all came from the same place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the difference was leadership. Yeah. And the difference in leadership was the men who chose to become good leaders versus the men who simply wanted to bask in, Take look forward. at me, I'm a colonel now. Um, we'll talk about that more in the future. But hey, we've just fallen back a few hundred more yards, right? We're about at the back end of the 70th Ohio camp right now. So. By this time, by the time they've fallen back through the camp, they have to get reorganized again uh, because there's no way they could have fallen back in a, in a line of battle. If there's anything that's saving them, it's that now the Confederates that are chasing them also lose their organization by when they come into the camp. But that doesn't mean the battle stops. That means the battle just becomes much more confusing and chaotic and terrifying as there's no longer lines of battle, it's just men you know, doing their best to fight. Now, the first thing that Colonel Cockrell did at this point, because he kept his head about him, is that once, the, once they had fallen back, once the 70th had fallen back through their tents, he attempted to organize, uh, he said, in a small ravine, I, I reorganized my regiment at right angles to my camp. What's he saying? He means probably... He puts his guys in this ravine that you can see right over there down and facing toward the Confederates that are flanking them. Uh, now, he obviously, he's at risk from the Confederates coming through the camp and falling on his right flank now, right? But first things first, they're being flanked on the left. So Cockrell manages after the regiment becomes disrupted, falling back to the camp, he rallies them. He gets them in line of battle, and they fight facing this direction for as long as they can. In this phase of the battle, uh, uh, one of the members of the 70th uh, Corporal, think Corporal, uh, Sam Evans, set himself up behind a tree over here and was shooting into the camp. Now, the story here with Evans is, is, is a very common one amongst the various soldiers, the way they viewed the battle after it was over. The first thing that Sam Evans' friend had written to him uh, after the battle was, did you kill anybody? What's it like to kill a man? (laughs) And so Evans, sitting down quietly after the battle, getting his nerves together after all this, carves out his own experience from all of this chaos. He carves out his own experience. He said, yeah, after, well, I'll tell you about killing someone. Uh, after we fell back from through the camp, I took a position behind a tree, and the Confederates came running into the camp. And the Confederates, instead of chasing us, they started to fall out and go into our tents and start to steal our stuff. And they started getting the breakfast out of the pots. The Confederates had not eaten in 24 hours, just to let you know. Um, the Confederates had been out there in the rain all night long. They capture the camp, some indiscipline gets into their ranks, and they start to fall out and sack the Union camps. And Sam Evans says, uh, I actually set myself up to where I could see the entrance to my tent. And I drew a bead on it, and I watched a Confederate come out and duck into my tent, and I pulled the trigger, and he disappeared into the tent, and then I had to continue retreating to the rear. When I returned to my tent after the battle, I went in there and I saw my mark dead, lying dead in my tent. Didn't seem to be bragging about it. Just saying, you asked, and I'm gonna tell you, and that's what it's like to kill somebody. That's one quiet moment for one soldier after the battle. What's happening now is the Confederates get reorganized and come out of the camp and more and more Confederates bend more and more around the flank. And again, the 70th Ohio has to fall back. General Sherman with the 70th, 48th, 72nd Ohio, he says this time, fall all the way back to the road. Fall back to the road. Everybody rally on the road. And Colonel Cockrell begins moving his men 
in the best organization he can get back toward the Hamburg Purdy Road. Follow me. friends to each other, let's be nice, let's be good neighbors, let's not swat each other in the face with, <laughs> with these things as we go along. Call out if you find a hole so that your neighbor doesn't end up turning their ankle. <laughs> when you come on a log, this is a Tennessee rule, step on the log and then over. Because it's about time to get to it. first made the attack and, and Colonel Appler realized that the Confederates were coming, um, he said, you know, get the sick out. Get, and he had 150 guys on his sick list, 150 guys in the hospital. And the quartermaster, a guy named Joseph Fulton, uh, gathered together all of the auxiliaries, all of the uh, freedmen who uh, belonged to, who, yeah, who were hired out by the officers, got them together into a little corps and then got them carrying the, the sick out to the wagons. And then, car then came, made a caravan all the way back, and all 150 of the sick from the 50th of Ohio got to the landing safely. None of them got caught by the, by the Confederates. Largely, that was because of the um, African-American camp servants who had been used as an auxiliary by the quartermaster. But I can't tell you about the 70th. They didn't. Mm -hmm. Didn't write about it? Yeah. <laughs> the white veterans didn't tell the story of the, mm -hmm. of the black camp uh, servants. Okay. We've reached the Hamburg Purdy Road. See? You're in it. Hamburg Purdy Road is one of the most important, the most important east west axis on the battlefield. Um, in order for one side or the other to be able to move their troops to the right or to the left, uh, they needed to have this road. And so at this episode, at about 10 30 on the morning of April 6th, uh, this spot in this road became the crucial place on this battlefield. And here is where the 70th Ohio happened to arrive at exactly that time. They fell back to this place and then Colonel Cockrell uh, uh, had to rally them and try to put them in line of battle. Now, what did they have to deal with? This. As I was, as I was saying while we were walking back, so I will say it again now while everyone can see and hear me, uh, the these Union soldiers did not get out of bed that morning expecting to lose a battle. They weren't expecting to fight a battle, but if they fought one, they were expecting to win the battle. And they marched 200 yards forward from their camp, and they really shot up the Confederates. They didn't take any of their stuff with them. And largely, the commanders didn't necessarily send the noncombatants to the rear. They did not expect to lose their camps. And it was not until the last minute that the men on the sick list and uh, uh, civilian auxiliaries, um, uh, you know, hired uh, officer servants, and so on and so forth. And in many a case, uh, many case, women, wives, family members of the officers who came down 
to spend some time with their family. You see that all over this battlefield. A lot of females on this battlefield during the, during the battle. Now they have to get to the rear. Now the battle's going against them and they have to get to the rear and they have to get to the rear fast. And they come to the rear with this cloud of refugees from the left that's been turned and driven in this direction. And then finally, at the same time, General Sherman calls out to the right, to the far right of his division, which is linked all the way down there to Owl Creek, guarding Owl Creek so the Confederates cannot get around the right. He tells them, we have to fall back, Colonel McDowell. Now you have to fall back. Now, Colonel McDowell and General Sherman. The first brigade down there by Owl Creek, they were having a great morning. <laughs> they were having a great morning. The Confederates were attacking over here and trying to get around the left flank, trying to get around the left flank. Nobody was trying to get around the right flank. And so all morning long, while this deadly, bloody combat is happening out here, the men in the 1st Brigade are standing, ready to fight, with very few Confederates in their front. They send skirmishers to the front, and the Confederates send some skirmishers and scouts out there. There's some skirmishing, but the 1st Brigade doesn't even have to fight for their camp until the order arrives, Colonel McDowell, get out, because the rest of the division has been shredded. It's time for you to get out. Well, Colonel McDowell not expecting to leave his camp and winning the battle he was fighting, never sent his wagons, never sent his logistical trail, never sent his quartermaster, never sent his sick men to the rear. Now there is no road leading from McDowell's camp to the rear. The only road, and they need a road because it's wagons, Horses, mules, sick men, supplies, all piled into the wagons and sent down the Hamburg Purdy Road to get to this intersection, to get to the crossroads where they can then turn left and go to Pittsburgh Landing. A traffic jam. The battle now takes place in a traffic jam as hundreds of men, hundreds of mules, dozens of wagons are piled up along this road. Union infantry, I, I think, yet I don't know, deployed on this side of the road with just feet between the wagons and the attacking Confederates. Over here on the left, a battery of artillery, Frederick Bear's battery, the Morton battery from Indiana, came down the road in front of the traffic jam and deployed at the crossroads. They were the battery that belonged to Colonel McDowell's brigade. They deployed their cannons, they got their cannons ready. Captain Bear rode right up, ready to give his first order. Confederates came out of these woods, they fired. Fred Bear was blown off his horse and killed instantly. And then the gunners deserted their guns and fled to the rear. Bear's, brigade, Bear's battery never fired a shot and the Confederates came flooding down. Now let's get out of the road. It was a mess. I mean, it had with all the traffic and all the water the days leading up to the battle. Exactly. It was just a total disaster. Let's let our friend get by. The phrase right here is almost impassable. And that is, that is what we're talking about. The Confederates are trying to get to the rear and they've managed to create a traffic jam for themselves. At that moment, now these first episodes of the battle were a real disaster for some of the Confederates. As we said before, three brigades tried to attack Buckland's brigade in the front and got chewed to pieces, each one of them, while many other brigades came around the left and began uh, turning the left flank of Sherman's division and pushing them to the north and to the northwest. As a result, when the Federals fell back from the tents to the road, which they did in utter confusion, hell-mell, utter confusion, the Confederates had a few minutes to reorganize their attack and get all of the brigades online and get the brigades that had come around the left online, turning 
and moving this direction, while these Confederates are moving this direction, more than half of the Confederate Army was now lined up and ready for the one big powerful blow that Johnston had always intended to turn the left flank of the enemy, drive them into the swamps, and destroy this army. Now, obviously, he'd made a mistake. He hadn't turned the left flank of the army, he just turned the left flank of Sherman's division, yet it was Sherman's division that was about to be crushed like a bug. And that is what happened at about 1030. Now, on the left here, uh, General John McClernand's division had moved up. In fact, one of McClernand's brigades had attempted to hold Sherman's left flank, and they had been driven back. But what I'm saying, what, what I want to give the impression here, at about 1030, those Confederates reorganized, came out of that woods. Cornbread yelp. Once again, just like we heard this morning out there in the Fraley field, that rebel yell, getting themselves wound up, firing volleys that are now scything through the Union line. And now the Union line is all messed up in this traffic jam. And they come marching around the left, they hit, this they hit this Union position, and as one Union witness said, at least about Sherman's division, Sherman's division gave way at all points at the same time. So several different stages of retreat. Sherman had offered very intense and bloody uh, resistance to the Confederates. Now the tables turned utterly. Confederates hit this position at this time, and in about 15 minutes, they drove two Union div divisions, pell-mell to the rear, absolutely rolled over them, uh, and especially over here in the area of McClernand's division, which was fresh, those 15 minutes were some of the most hellish combat of the entire battle. Uh, 15 or 20 minutes, less than 30, that crossroads just became piled with dead and wounded blown down. But over here on Sherman's division, up against the uh, up against the, the this traffic jam, Sherman's division gave way at all points at all times. With this exception, the Confederates that came up to the front of Cockrell's 70th Ohio Regiment came out of those woods. The 70th Ohio got ready. They started firing volleys into the Confederates. The came, Confederates came up, close range fight. Confederates were cut down to the right and to the left. The, the Sherman's uh, division collapsed, and then the Confederates went flowing around the flanks and disappeared into the rear. Those Confederates in front retreated, and suddenly Joe Cockrell's regiment is standing in line of battle behind the Confederate lines, facing the wrong way in utter silence. In fact, one of the officers that was nearby, let me get my quote, quote out of here because I want to get this one right. And also this officer, this is where we first see, we already know that Joe Cockrell is in, intent on learning his new profession and doing it right. But here's a, 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 a quote from one of the people that was on this spot at that moment. All around was the roar of musketry. Immediately about us was the silence, literally of death, for the ground was strewn with the dead of both armies. Then Colonel Cockrell rode at the head of his regiment in a perfectly cool and matter-of-fact way, as if it was his custom to pass through such, such scenes every Sunday morning. So in the face of this extremely now surreal situation, an entire Union regiment caught in the rear of the Confederate Army while the Confederate Army rushes pell-mell to pursue the retreating division. What does Colonel Cockrell do with his men now? In a very cool and matter-of-fact way, he orders them to form a column of march. It's easier to march your men around in a column than it is a line of battle where they're all spread out armed arm in a column of march, just like they would on 4th of July parade, and said, follow me. And they got up into the road, and they began marching through the river. Follow me. Paul says, it's considerably 
different than retreat and save yourself. <laughs> Things seemed a little surreal before, now they're going to get weird. <laughs> so here comes the 70th Ohio marching down this road uh, as if they're on a 4th of July parade, uh, well behind the Confederate lines. Now, why isn't anybody noticing? Most of the reasons are the ones that are probably occurring to you right now. This is an incredibly bloody, chaotic battle. The entire landscape is covered with smoke. Um, officers on both sides are dead or wounded. So the people who could give an order to respond to a situation are simply not there anymore. The Confederates, having defeated, uh, having defeated these two Union divisions, are now, some of them are pursuing to the south. Uh, and then one more, as we saw uh, happening, one more reason, as we saw happening in Buckland's camp, the Confederates are exhausted and they have not eaten in 24 hours, the privates and all that, uh, the privates and lower ranks have not eaten, and indiscipline is starting to affect the Confederate line, which is a strange thing to say when just 15 minutes ago they were able to deliver POW the strongest single attack of the entire Battle of Shiloh, uh, more than half the Confederate Army blew through here. But that victory, that victory totally disorganized the Confederates. And indeed, they had captured all those camps, and very quickly they captured another camp, 45th Illinois camp, right over here in the Wolf Field. Lots of breakfast. <laughs> Lots of breakfast, still boiling in pots or, or sitting out. Uh, and lots of Yankee uh, Sibley tents to sack and, um, and maybe the officer who should be keeping the men in line of battle and to their jobs is lying dead back here at the crossroads, you know, 30 seconds after he said, follow me, and pointed that sword <laughs> forward. Or ransacking a tent himself. Or ransacking a tent himself, something like that. So here comes, here comes the 70th Ohio, marching down here like it's a Sunday morning. It is a Sunday morning. Uh, marching down here like a parade into this total chaos. And then one of the officers, in fact, it was the officer who gave us our quote before, um, it was attached from another, he had fled from another Union regiment and attached himself to the 70th because clearly somebody knows what they're doing, uh, came along here and at about this position, uh, he looks off to the right. He says, in this underbrush, off to the right. And what he's talking about is Water Oaks Pond, I think. Because this is a pond, and at the time that would have been overgrown with, uh, thickly overgrown with weeds and uh, bushes and thorns and briars and so on and so forth. Played an important part in the second day's battle uh, as a Confederate strong point. But at this time, as they march by, this officer looks off to the right, and through the smoke, uh, he sees a regiment marching also in column of march uh, toward this regiment. And he, he sees a, a, a friend of his who's sitting here also by the side of the road. They're from other regiments, so they're not in, in, uh, in the column of march. So they're standing off to the side, scratching their heads, going, what's going on over there? And as the regiment comes marching toward them, they see this regiment marching uh, towards them is in blue uniforms. They're marching to the front in blue uniforms, and they are marching in such a way as that they will soon intersect the path of the 70th Ohio. And so while Cockrell and his men marched down the road, 
uh, these these two comrades are standing here going, hmm. One of them says, you know what? Those are Confederates. I'm going to shoot at them. And the other guy says, no, 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 no. Those are, they're in blue uniforms. They're, they're, uh, you don't want to shoot at your own guys. And they, they're sitting here arguing about it when suddenly the, a wind comes through. The wind, of course, blows some of the smoke away, and the wind blows up the flag of this uh, blue-coated regiment that's marching up on us, and it is the Pelican flag of the state of Louisiana. And, and immediately the guys call out, Colonel Cockerell, Colonel Cockerell, look over here. And Cockerell sees them, two regiments in blue coats marching, about to come together. Cockerell very quickly gives the order that everybody should fall out, form a line of battle on the road, facing that way. Load your muskets, ready, aim, fire, pow! The Pelican Regiment never saw what was coming. Wow. In fact, they may well have thought another regiment of Louisiana troops with blue uniforms was about to match them. So, Cockrell got the idea of what was happening faster than the opposing colonel. His regiment responded to the bizarre situation faster and better. They formed a line of battle. They shot through the Confederates. The Louisianans turned and ran, ran back. They would have had to reorganize and come back and do it again, um, which is something that happens, you'll see again and again at the Battle of Shiloh. There are Union regiments that have gray uniforms. There are Confederate regiments that have blue uniforms. These two armies had not yet completed standardizing the way they're going to look when they march into battle. Uh, some of these Louisiana troops just thought they looked better in blue coats. So <laughs> the so the colonel bought them all blue coats. Same thing in the north. The the the, uh, the Guthrie Grays uh, from Cincinnati. They well, the, they've worn gray suit, gray uniforms all these years. They're not going to change now just because the rebels want to wear a gray uniform. So this battlefield has a lot of friendly fire happening, often because of vanity. <laughs> one side or the other, just one regiment or the other, just wants to wear a blue or a gray suit. Having gotten through this particularly bizarre episode unscathed, Colonel Cockrell ordered his regiment to form line to form a column of march. Turn toward their friends. Follow me. For just a moment, but uh, but just to sort of illustrate what happened on this this leg of our journey is, you know, the Confederates had pursued and moved forward, but they were disorganized. But the most uh, uh, the the most uh, inspired, most effective, best led Confederates were pushing to the front, pushing through a Union camp, more camps out here to our right as we're facing. So all those assembly tents and all of this totally cleared off is the drill ground for oh. the brigade that was camped here. So not only is this not as thick then as it is now, this is totally cut off uh, by the Federals so that they could use it as a drill ground. And Cockrell's parade marched right through the Confederate line of battle from their rear, past them, marched right out into no man's land, down the road, and joined their comrades in Jones Field. Without missing a step, <laughs> Colonel Cockrell at the front, as though it was his custom to, to see such scenes every Sunday morning. Okay, so our next stop mm -hmm. is just to continue our journey until we get to the light down there, until we get to Jones Field. Then we're going to turn around and come back. And uh, by the time we get back to our cars, we'll probably have run out of things to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.
peeled. And if you look to your rear, you'll see those rectangular blue tablets. And those represent the Union Army at the time that those two divisions that were driven off of the crossroads reached this field and began to re rally and reorganize. Began to rally and reorganize, especially General McClernand's division, which is basically where we're standing and then stretching across the field. These various blue tablets tell about the story of units in McClernand's division. General McClernand's division, mostly Illinois troops, and mostly troops that had signed up at the very beginning of the war, so men who had been in the service for about a year, mostly men who had experienced battle, whether it be the Battle of Fredericktown, Missouri, the Battle of <coughs> Belmont, Missouri, Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson, these were the core volunteers of General Grant's army that had been with General Grant through these battles. As a result, they're probably the best soldiers on this battlefield, at least as far as having combat experience and a year in the service to, to train. As a result, even though they were shredded, even though they were crushed at the crossroads, even though they left the crossroads running for their lives, they had enough experience as soldiers, as leaders, with good non-commissioned officers, that as soon as they put enough space between the Confederates and themselves, that they knew they weren't about to get shot in the back, they did what good soldiers do. They stopped. They rallied. They reorganized. Dead officers were immediately replaced by the next guy in line because they had practiced this before. And so in a remarkably short time, a division that had been completely crushed, rallied and turned to face the enemy and stopped them here. More importantly, artillery, both from McClernand's division and from Sherman's division that had fled from the crossroads position, principally Captain Barrett's battery, where we started our program this morning, set up their guns right here and immediately began sending lead down toward the Confederates. Even as Cockrell led his troops down this road, Union cannonballs were shooting over them and hitting the Confederates. So that even as the Confederates fell, fell victim to indiscipline, as they started to fall out and sack the camps a little bit, as the momentum of their attack started to slow down, immediately the Federals resisted. The Federals resisted, and for a period of time, the battle ceased. It went from being a total Confederate victory to a stalemate, the battle ceasing. And then by the time Cockrell reached this position, Cockrell, as he arrived here, would have been General Sherman's only organized infantry uh, because the rest of Buckland's brigade went to the rear. They had shot up their ammunition and Buckland took his two regiments to the rear. The third brigade, Colonel Hildebrand, had been destroyed in that flanking maneuver, flanking problem up by uh, Shiloh Church. The second brigade, which we've never even talked about because they weren't here at all. They were on the far left of the battlefield, Stewart's brigade, fighting an entire different battle for different reasons that we can talk about in a different context. So for a moment, General Sherman has only the 70th Ohio. However, remember the orders that Sherman had got given to Colonel McDowell. Colonel McDowell, whose men had the slow, lazy morning while the rest of the re division was fighting for their lives. Well, Colonel McDowell's trains were destroyed and captured and sacked at the crossroads, but Colonel McDowell's infantry, who had not been seriously involved, moved to the rear cross country, which meant that through various very exciting adventures of their own, which we've done in other programs, McDowell, by the time the forces rally here, McDowell comes marching up out of this ravine from Sowell Field with three fresh regiments that have not yet been in battle. So now suddenly General Sherman goes from having no, re no division at all to having something he can work with. A fresh brigade of three full infantry regiments and the 70th Ohio under Cockrell, which had done an impressive job so, so far in the battle. 
as well as, very importantly, his artillery. You know, Barrett's battery still survived. They're some of the toughest veterans in this army. Chicago Light Artillery is what they're called, Battery B, Chicago Light Artillery. And they're standing there when everyone, when no one else is fighting, they're sending cannonballs down, down range just to let the Confederates know there's still a battle going on. At that moment, one of the critical moments of the Battle of Shiloh, one of the critical moments of the Battle of Shiloh occurs. One of those moments of contingency that historians talk about. In this moment, based on a decision that some leaders make, history could go one way or history could go another. And I do think this is one of those moments of contingency of the Civil War. The Confederates have destroyed two Union divisions. Two Union divisions fall back and manage to just barely reorganize and rally. For a time, five cannons are the only thing offering resistance to the Confederates. In that moment, General McClernand and General Sherman meet right here. They put their heads together. They said, well, we could try to fight it out here. We try to fight it out here, and the Confederates are going to hit us again, just like they did before. Or we could go back across this ravine, but then we'll break the line, and, and our comrades in the center will be open to flanking. And without much consideration at all, without ever really questioning what they might do, they arrived at this decision. In this circumstance, beaten, demoralized, routed, just reorganizing, what do we do? Attack. Attack the Confederates. If they're not going to come down in here and fight us, we're going to go back there and we're going to take our camps back. And in that moment, the toughest Yankee division on this battlefield along with the one fresh Union Brigade from Sherman's division, turned from beaten and fleeing to attacking and pursuing. The counterattack, quite possibly, in my opinion, the most important moment, the most important decision, and the most important action of the first day of battle. Notwithstanding a little skirmish over here that some people call the hornet's nest. <laughs> but we can fight about that some other time because we're concentrating on the battle on the west side of the battlefield right now. And I do think the counterattack was the crucial decision uh, for the Union forces that day to buy time, uh, not by standing firm, but by taking it to the Confederates, by fighting back. So. Our next stop, let's let's head on back this direction. Gonna do a little more boy scouting. <laughs> hey y'all. Yes. How many men did Costco make it to this position? Oh, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. But he did say, he was honest in saying that his his regiment got broken in two. So the adjutant of the regiment, uh, an officer named Phillips, uh, took a pretty significant fraction of the regiment and went and fought in other places. Totally split, totally split. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And because uh, in his report, Cockrell is, is is very solicitous in saying, you know, Adjutant uh, Phillips did a great job uh, taking half the regiment and fighting them on his own without him. Uh, he did not have. But he probably that, still had four or five hundred men. Uh, half of what he started out with. Yeah. But we didn't lose that much. The half was killed. Right. Okay. All right, what well, we're going to do before we voice out here is
just cut that corner so that we could get onto the axis of advance of Sherman's division. In the counterattack, as it rolled forward, McClernand's division mostly had, they were astride the road and then they went through their camps. Sherman's division, uh, uh, what was left of it, but McDowell's brigade with the 70th Ohio came on this side of the road. And again, I remind you, all of this area had been totally cleared out to provide training grounds for McClernand's uh, troops. And so as they moved across this landscape, they were totally in the open, and the Confederates were downrange and could be seen as they marched along. Uh, McDowell's brigade held the left, and then Cockrell attached his 70th Ohio to the right flank of the counterattack. And so they would have come down through that ravine and up into here. The Confederates would have laid before them here. And then the counterattack rolled forward. And those most, the most ambitious, the most combative Confederates that had rushed ahead to try to attack were now getting pushed back pell-mell uh, toward those Confederates who were reorganizing uh, in the captured camps. And now they were getting ready to defend against a Union attack. So let's follow down uh, this trail. Park Reed was here okay. the whole time. Okay. Um, and uh, you know when people, he had a system when a, a veteran came to visit mm -hmm. the park. He, he had he had his people with forms mm -hmm. sit down and interview yeah. the veteran, and then go out and walk around, say where were you and where was this, and then they would take notes and then compare that to so the records because yeah. uh, you know memories yeah. <laughs> can be tricky. But I mean, yeah, he's double and tricky. Double and who's the gentleman again? David W. Reed. Yeah, Major David W. Reed of the 12th Iowa Regiment. Okay. He's a soldier in the battle, and then later he was the first historian of the park. Why the hornet's, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the hornet's nest gets a lot of love. <laughs> um, but here we are. Here we are. Uh, now, like I said, when the counterattack starts, McClernand is on the left and Sherman is on the right. Uh, Sherman had uh, McDowell's brigade of three regiments. He had the 70th Ohio. And then also, as they were mounting off, I forgot to give credit where credit was due a few minutes ago. In the early part of the battle, uh, uh, one of the brigades belonging to the Union 2nd Division, W.H.L. Wallace's division, one of those brigades had several regiments cut out of it in order to provide a reserve or guards or so on and so forth. And so for instance, the 81st Ohio ended up being guarding the, br the bridge over Snake Creek. Um, and then another one of the regiments, the 13th Missouri Regiment under Colonel Kraft's right, was sent to reinforce Sherman. So when Sherman was having a hard time out there by Shiloh Church, he asked his boss Grant for help Grant didn't have much help to send, but he did have this one regiment, the 13th Missouri, and he sent Colonel Wright out to help General Sherman. And so Wright and the 13th Missouri, Missouri met Sherman in the Jones Field. They didn't get there in time to fight uh, uh, at the crossroads, but they met Sherman at Jones Field. So now Sherman's counterattack force is getting a little more impressive. He's got uh, McDowell's whole brigade of three regiments. He's got the 70th Ohio and... He's got the 13th Missouri, which is fresh, has not yet been in a battle, in the battle. So as, as the counterattack moves this way, the Confederates are pushed back. However, however, the Confederates who have overwhelmed Sherman and McClernand at the crossroads still enjoy a considerable a considerable superiority in numbers. And as soon as they got their guys reorganized, 
they could provide a line of battle that was much stronger and much longer than the Yankees coming to attack them. Uh, most significantly, one of the brigades from the Confederate Reserve Corps was a brigade of Kentucky troops, Kentucky and Alabama troops, so it's called the Kentucky Brigade. Um, and they suddenly became available to the Confederates. They were the last reserves coming up out of General Beauregard's reserve. And so they were sent to the left and they were hooking around to the right of the Yankees and to the left of the Confederates, uh, the Confederate left. And so the Confederate flank was considerably longer than the Union flank. So as the Union counterattack moved straight forward, <coughs> those Confederates out there on the flank started to reorient from here to here, facing this direction, make, meaning that the Federals are marching right into a flanking fire. As a result, as Sherman on the right of the counterattack moves forward, he can see the Confederates over there. The other side of that ravine right there is much clearer at the time. So as he moved forward, rather than exposing his flank to a flank fire, the regiment on the right, when they got to a certain point, would stop and reorient and face the Confederates, while the rest of the line continued forward. Now with a new right flank regiment. And when that regiment cleared the left flank of the 70th Ohio, they stopped, reoriented, and advanced to protect the flank of the counterattack. Now with each of the regiments peeling off, the counterattack got weaker and weaker. Um, but the flank of the counterattack was protected. And as a result, when the 70th, who was on the right of the counterattack when it started, reached this position, they turned and faced Confederates on the other side of that ravine. Confederates they were facing belonged to uh, what had been, uh, what was uh, Brigadier General Patrick Claiborne's uh, brigade. Uh, at that, that particular group led by uh, uh, Colonel Benjamin Hill and also uh, elements of Colonel uh, Robert M. Russell's brigade were over there. And then on the Confederate right of those were those Kentucky troops uh, further down the line. So this is as far as the 70th Ohio got in their counterattack. They were peeled off to protect the flank. And then here they stood for how long? From 12 to two. For two hours, they stood on this hill and protected the flank fighting against Claiborne and uh, Russell on the other side of this, of this ravine. Um, once the counterattack was driven back again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Once the counterattack was driven back, the 70th Ohio had to retreat. They retreated back to Jonesfield and thence back to Grant's last line. We are not going to do that. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, that would take us even further from our cars. The idea right now is to get closer to our cars. So this will be the end of the story for now of the fighting of the 70th Ohio on the first day of the battle. But before we head back, I want to take you to the place where the 70th Ohio fought on the second day of the battle. Are you ready? Okay. Excuse me. On the second day of the battle. <laughs> <laughs> Over with second day. Uh, nice. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you were a step ahead of me. <laughs> um, yes, on the second day of the battle, Buckland's brigade was reorganized, and uh, Sherman with uh, McClernand on his left and General Lou Wallace on the right flank counterattacked, came up, and as fate would have it, the as they moved across the landscape, the 70th Ohio under Colonel Cockrell became engaged in exactly the same position where they had fought the day before. Uh, and so, as the Confederates are now getting pushed back, Buell's army over there, fresh troops attacking that way, Wallace's division of Grant's army over here attacking that way, and then Sherman coming straight up the middle across the same landscape that he'd fought on during the counterattack, the 70th ended up fighting a, fighting a battle facing 90 degrees different 
uh, on the exact same spot. And then the second day of the battle proceeded with us, with them following where we're going to go straight forward. And again, the 70th Ohio attacked on the second day of the battle in the footsteps of McDowell's counterattack, the same attack that they had been involved in at noon on the first day of the battle. So, follow me, we'll head right on down this, uh, this trail. Ohio reorients, the 46th Ohio uh, goes on past them. They realize that the Confederates, now we're in the front of the Kentucky Brigade, which has come around the Confederate left of the field on the other side of that uh, ravine called Crescent Field. Uh, the Confederate Kentucky Brigade is now oriented this way, while the 46th Ohio is facing this way. So uh, uh, Colonel Worthington of the 46th Ohio gives the order, halt, reorient and face this way and as the 46 turns to face the Kentuckians um, uh, pretty well trained regiment the 46 they load their weapons they aim they fire they get the first fire on the Kentucky uh, brigade and that's a very effective fire and a lot of the Kentuckians are cut down over there but then the Kentuckians return fire Ohio returns fire Kentucky returns fire and this again, like over there in the 70th Ohio, goes on for about two hours. A stand-up firefight with both sides just cutting down the other, the other side's troops who are laid out here in their line of battle. Or when the dead or the wounded go down, their comrades drag them out of the line of battle and make a, you know, a little line back here for the dead and a, a place up there for the regimental surgeon to help with the wounded. Stand-up firefight. Goes on for about two hours between the 47th, 46th Ohio and the Kentucky Brigade. Let's continue on down our trail. Iowa, commanded by Captain John Williams, because uh, McDowell was commanding the, uh, uh, the brigade. And again, they, they turn, they reorient, and they fight. Again, it's still the Kentucky Brigade on the other side of the ravine. And for two hours, they deck it out. Now, there's one thing that's a little different about their experience, although the, the Ohioans uh, lost heavily, the 46th Ohio lost heavily, the 70th Ohio uh, was much more fortunate. Uh, but nevertheless, they fought for the two hours. Um, but the, uh, uh, in this case, after the 90 minutes or two hours of stand-up firefight, the Kentuckians uh, felt like they had knocked down enough Yankees to push the line. And this is how this particular episode of the battle ends up. Um, the, after two and a half, after one and a half to two hours of the stand-up firefight, uh, the officers of the Kentucky Brigade can see that these Iowans and these Ohioans are starting to start just, st you can see the line waver a little bit. You can see the gaps open up where they've knocked down uh, Union soldiers. And, and maybe the, the, Un the Iowans are not as, not as quick to close up their ranks and, and uh, present a strong front. One thing to understand, when these regiments suffer casualties, they close ranks. So if, if they're in a line of battle, two, two ranks and, and 100 files or whatever, uh, if someone's shot down, they don't just leave that spot open. Someone steps and close, is supposed to close the line. 
Now, most of the Union regiments being new to combat, uh, they understood that if, if a, 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 a post was open, if somebody left their post of duty, if someone was shot, if someone was wounded, and the ranks had to be closed, they would close on the colors. You know what that means? The colors are in the middle, right? So anybody in the right flank of the regiment steps to the left. Anybody in the left flank of the regiment, if that happens, steps to the right. Again, remember this is a battle and there's smoke everywhere and it's very hard to see. So if that happens with all of the regiments and the commanders are not on top of it, these regiments, as their regimental front shrinks toward their colors, what happens? Gaps. It opens gaps. It opens gaps between the regiments. And that is one of the things that the Kentuckians might perceive. And so they raise up that rebel yell. They fix their bayonets. And they decide that this firefight is over. They're going to finish it. And they came straight down that ravine and straight up. And they drove the Iowans from this position. And that was really one of the times when this counterattack started to falter. And you'll see that because casualties were heavy everywhere. But here in the 6th Iowa, we have 632 uh, people in the ranks. They had 52 killed and uh, 52 killed, 100 wounded, 37 missing, total of 189 casualties. Almost all of them happened right here. Roughly most of those 52 would have been killed right along this line, would have been lined up behind their comrades, uh, and then the regiment driven from this position. They put up a marker where the 52 were, but they moved the body to the side of the mountain. So the Confederates are still there? Confederates are still in the mountain. Yeah. 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 Again, they would be driven from this position when the Kentuckians raised up there. After two hours of fighting, raised up their yell and attacked in that direction. Continue on down.
the apex of the counterattack. And by the time we reach the, the furthest point of the counterattack, Sherman's entire force has peeled off to face south and southwest, or to face southwest and west uh, to protect the flank. And only McClernand's uh, division is pushing forward. <clears throat> but here, if you turn to the back, you can see a monument, a, a tablet for Cobb's Kentucky Battery. That is their artillery battery associated with the Kentucky Brigade that's fighting on the other side of the uh, ravine. And the eight, then McClernand's Illinois and Iowa troops come rushing right up to that, and they cut right through Cobb's guns, and they capture that battery. They capture that battery, they hit the Confederate line of battle that's been reformed, and the Confederates are driven back. Confederates retreat pretty much all the way into the next line of camp, the 45th Illinois. You see another Confederate battery is right there. And so this is about the point where the Confederate line that had been winning and attacking coalesced and then became driven back, disorganized, coalesced and hardened and McClernand beat up against them and then it turned around again and the Confederates counterattacked the counterattack and for another bloody hour of fighting between 2 and about 3 and 3.30, this whole thing happened again with the Confederates pushing McClernand and Sherman back through that camp until finally they were back into Jones Field. They fought in Jones Field for about another hour before finally Sherman and McClernand couldn't take any more. <laughs> they were cut to pieces, they were out of ammunition, and they finally fell back across Tillman Branch and joined General Grant's last line. That's gonna be the end of our interpretation for today. We have reached the end of our time, and the next good program, the next program is going to start at 11, 30 minutes from now. So I recommend, it's going to be a good program. So if there's any other, anybody that wants to make that program, let's just hit the road, you follow this road all the way to our cars, and you'll be able to get to your car in time to make the 11 o'clock program. And if you want to do some Q&A, let's do it on the run, huh? Where is Thank the 11 o'clock program? program. You,